dun, dun, Shivy. Dun, uh, <laughs> is, is Shivy, is that what I should Shivy, call you? Yes. Okay. Shivy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I had on a t-shirt earlier and I had to change because I knew you were going to come up here looking like you're on the cover of GQ. So. That's, that's a whole cap. <laughs> That's the whole <laughs> I really did have a t-shirt on, shirt on earlier. You could have let me know. I would have, you know, come on, man. All right. All right. <laughs> so today we're going to get into a little bit about who you are, why yeah. you're running for public office, what should voters know about you. But yeah. before we do all of that, we're going to do a segment called How Atlanta Are You? All right. All right. And you, your accent does not sound like an Atlanta accent. So where are you from? So I was born in East Orange in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, and moved here uh, when I was about five years old uh, with my father, who graduated from Morehouse College and lived here from 88 to about 95, moved back home uh, and returned to Atlanta in 2004 and been here ever since. So I spent most of my life in Atlanta. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, spent a lot of time in Jersey, mm. which was uh, home. Got it. Yeah. All right. So in How Atlanta Are You, uh, tell us, who are you listening to these days? What Atlanta artists? What Atlanta artists am I listening to these days? Um, been listening to Earth Gang. Been listening to, uh, man, God, to be honest with you, during this campaign, I've been doing very little listening to music that does not surprise me yeah and i mean i'm a music head like for anyone who knows who i am like you know i was a freestyle friday hall of famer on bet's 106 in park like i come from hip-hop culture um you want to drop some bars no, man listen <laughs> <laughs> look we want to win all the votes today so <laughs> why did i feel like something told me in my mind you you might ask me to fit some bars i'm not gonna do it my I'm caveat gonna was it. gonna be you have to beatbox in the so. runoff Oh, let's get it. Let's get it. <laughs> you look like you might have some bars. No, 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 no. Cap? No. <laughs> I can't, you know, keep that under wraps. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, what's in heavy rotation? Listen, I honestly, I've been listening to music from all around. Like, you know, I've been listening to the Donda album, been listening to the CLB album, um, always listening to like some Atlanta classics like AT Aliens, listening to um old TI, you know, things like that. Like I don't I, I'm a substance guy. So it's all about the lyrics for me. So that's typically, you know, what I'm on right now. Got but it. my all high right. school age son is a whole nother story. Got it. Know. So so speaking of family, what are some spots that you like to take the family to around the city? Uh definitely the Beltline. Uh especially on the east side. Like that's my thing if anybody follows me on social you'll see like i ride a a one wheel which is like the electric skateboard with the one wheel in the middle uh and, and have you fallen off of that before definitely okay. ate dirt definitely <laughs> ate dirt a few times um but yeah I, I you know i ride the one wheeler or ride my my lawn board with my sons and we just ride the belt line that's to me the best place in the city to go by far are you a chicken wings person Absolutely. Okay, so I got a question for you. Okay. What would be worse? All the chicken wing spots in Atlanta are closed. Or every time you approach a light, it turns red. I eat all the reds as long as I can eat wings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, like we definitely got to have our wings. Like, is it even Atlanta without wings? I don't know. I don't eat wings. I don't eat chicken, so. Ah, bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart. I got the southern bless your heart. All right. <laughs> I was a I was a pescatarian for uh, a few years uh, when I was in high school, and the thing I craved the most chicken. Really, I could do without. Could do some cauliflower but wings. <laughs> Y'all see my face? <laughs> the blasphemy. Hey. Hey, Antonio Brown, who I interviewed, also doesn't eat chicken. He's he's actually vegan. So Bless we, his heart, too. But Antonio's allergic to everything. Yes, that's what he said. He can't drink water. So. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shivy, what's one thing Atlanta should be known for that nobody knows about? It's like a hidden secret. Uh, it should be known for black prosperity. It's, it's already known for black prosperity, wouldn't you say? I think because folks don't really know the wiser. The truth of Atlanta is that we have the worst wealth disparity gap in the entire country. Got a 4% chance for 
black young people to rise out of the thresholds of poverty. Um, the truth is, is that Atlanta does a very good job at selling a particular image. But if people actually looked at the numbers, if people actually paid attention uh, to what the reality is for everyday Atlantans, especially everyday black Atlantans, uh, it doesn't fall in alignment with what people think the city is. Mm. All right, that was deep. Um, so we'll close the How Atlanta Are You segment <laughs> on a deep note. <laughs> or now we'll get into the, the, the meat of the, the matter here today. Yeah. Um, you're running for a public office. Chevy may not be a name that folks have heard before. So who are you? Just give us a little bit of that background. Yeah, um, I'm the son of a Morehouse man uh, who was an active NAACP member, uh, active Panther uh, back in the day. I grew up in the movement. Uh, my mother uh, is an immigrant from Guyana, South America. So I'm a first generation American as well. And, you know, I spent most of my life living in Atlanta and I started my being present in the movement in 1991 after the beating of Rodney King. And I remember marching the streets of Atlanta and crossing over the bridges in the city and seeing tent cities and people living under the city in poverty and asking my dad why people were living in those type of conditions, not really able to understand it at that time. And I look at over the last year and a half, the time that we spent marching through the streets of Atlanta and I have to explain to my sons exactly the same conditions that existed for over 30 years now. And it is extremely disheartening to me um, that not enough is being done for the most vulnerable people in our city and in our community. Um, I'm a person who really cares about our community a lot. And I dedicate my life uh, to be in the service of others, which is why I'm a teacher, which is why I worked for the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities before being a teacher. Um, all of my work has always been centered on our community and on our people. Um, and so me running for office right now is strictly a continuum of making sure that we have the best outcomes for the most of us and especially the most vulnerable people. So you're a teacher. Tell me what it has been like teaching in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> ghetto <laughs> like, okay. it's, it's um you know teaching during a pandemic is is extremely tough and it's not just a pandemic alone it is us being thrusted into the social justice movement in the midst of a pandemic and you know I wasn't just a bystander I was a person who was on the front lines of the social justice movement um from after George Floyd to being there the night that Rayshard was killed to being there after Ashley Cooley gets kicked in the face, being there when Park Cannon gets arrested for knocking on the governor's door fighting against voter suppression. Um, you know, I've been there alongside of a lot of young forward thinking leaders and grassroots people um, this entire time. And so my students are out there marching with me many times. My students are there pushing back against resolutions by the State Board of Education to stop conversations about race or racism, um, debunking the myth of meritocracy and, and these type of things. Um, and so while we have to worry about risking our lives um, due to a disease, we also have to worry about risking our lives due to not having the proper protections we need against gun violence in schools, um, while dealing with lack of resources and lack of access in our communities, while dealing with the whitewashing of history and not being, uh, in, in being in fear of losing your job because you tell the truth in the classroom. You know, being a teacher during a pandemic and during a social justice movement feels like you're constantly um, under attack to simply do your job in a way that you know will create liberation for babies who look like you. What's your take on cancel culture? It's a real thing. And I think it's lazy. I believe in the philosophy of counseling, not can not can counseling, not canceling. Um, I think cancel culture is easy to do. And it is simply a microcosm of what America is. 
we love to build people up just to burn them down. Um, we see it happen quickly. We see it happen over years or decades. Um, but it is the spectacle of it. We like to see people do things we've never done before just to see them fail in ways we hope to never fail. Um, it's some weird fetish in American culture. So what would be the opposite? Counsel, heal, understand, uh, center the humanity of people. Um, free ourselves from the expectation that people will be perfect, that they'll never make mistakes. Be transparent enough as humans so that when we do make mistakes, others can learn from it and stop putting up facades. Hmm. Um, Shivy, you are running against an incumbent um, who's been on council for off and on for a number of years. Tell us why you decided to do that. Being involved in local government is something that I've always been around my entire life. Um, I started canvassing for Democrats when I was a high schooler. Um, I went to school for public policy uh, at Georgia State University School of Public, Andrew Young School of Public Policy. Um, and I worked as a legislative aide at the Capitol. And I understand the impact that policy has on our community. And as a person who grew up in the movement, you grow up being very cognizant and aware of what systemic racism and systemic oppression and suppression looks like for our people and for our community. The only answer to it is policy. It is the only answer. And one of the things that is extremely challenging in a city like Atlanta is that most of our leadership looks like us. So by default, we believe that those who look like us are for us. But when you start to watch how people vote, when you start to watch whether or not people move in the interest of our community, you gain a better understanding of the reality that all skin folk and can folk. And in this particular seat with this particular incumbent, whether it was a vote against the Rayshard Brooks law, which would have made it illegal to, to put a person in a chokehold in Atlanta or shoot a fleeing suspect or call for more police accountability, whether it be the police training facility vote, which is going to impose environmental racism in a predominantly black area of the city, which is a mile and a half away from my home, in which to this day, for the last 10 years, I get woken up out of my bed or have to explain to my five-year-old son why we could hear gunshots being fired off in rapid succession right around the corner. Where they're gonna be burning buildings over and over in the backyards of black babies. When I see a particular individual voting for these things, taking what used to be a homeless shelter and creating a jail, the amount of corruption and unethical behavior, and this is a person who represents me and my local government, there's only so long that I could sit back and allow that to be true and not put my proverbial hat in the ring and do something about it. I think our city deserves to have leadership in this particular seat that is responsive to what the people want. It's just truly time. So let's say you get elected. Uh, what are the your priorities? What are the, you know, in the first 100 days or so of you being elected, what are you prioritizing? In mass homelessness within the next three years. Our city has over 900 acres of undeveloped land. A $20 million investment could create enough tiny home villages to have transitional housing as part of our infrastructure plan so that no person has to sleep in the heat or the cold or the rain. It would be to close the wealth disparity gap between blacks and whites. We cannot be the black Mecca of America and have the predominant majority of black people in this city living under poverty. This can't be true. We can't allow it to stay true. Um, and I want to make sure that every young person, every family, every senior has access to the internet. I believe that it is a human right 
to be able to have access to the internet. So I want to create a 5G broadband uh, Wi-Fi service that will be municipally owned that will allow every Atlanta access to the internet free or low cost, no more than $20 a month. And if I could do those three things, which I think are extremely tangible and pragmatic, even if I get one term in office, then I feel like I would have made the city better. So how would you fund that first fund, the $20 million? How would you fund that? <laughs> to make it make sense, I mean, $20 million is 4% of the police budget. $20 million is a small fraction of CARES money that we got. We have the money to do it. If we've got $90 million to build a 85-acre police training facility, we got $20 million to make sure that no one sleeps outside. So of those three things that you talked about, I mean, as you know, for council, you have to get at least eight votes, right, for a piece of legislation to pass. And then you have to hope also that the mayor doesn't veto the legislation. Mm -hmm. How do you get folks to buy into your point of view? I don't think I have to sell it. So what we also have to keep in mind is that Atlanta City Council is not going to be looking like it has. There is truly a progressive and pragmatic wave of new leadership coming to Atlanta City Council, guaranteed. And y'all can mark my word on this. There is new leadership that will be coming in that will be for making sure that we have universal access to the internet. There is going to be a collective movement to make sure that we end the wealth gap in Atlanta. These, type, these things are, are not just shared by me alone. But additionally, I think now is a time where we need leadership that is able to build bridges across the aisle, across ideologies, across age demographics. Now is really that time. And I think that is one of my God-given gifts is the ability to be a bridge builder across um, whatever barriers would seemingly be there. Um, you know, I talked about my biological father and who he was, but my stepfather is a white male that lives in rural Pennsylvania and is a Republican. And I'm just as close to him as I am my biological father. And I think having the opportunity to grow up in a family structure that allowed me to see things across ideologies, across cultural differences, um, has given me the ability to help others find common ground with each other and move forward in it for a common mission and outcome. No matter who the mayor is gonna be, um, given the front runners who are on the field, I have a working relationship with all but one I have not had the chance to meet yet. Um, in terms of the people who are on council, those who are currently on council have good relationships with the majority of them already. Um, I have the benefit of being a person who's never been elected before, but has a lot of relationships with people in office um, and people throughout the community. And I think that unique uh, dynamic is going to make change all the more possible and feasible. As a council person, how would you change the current way the community is engaged uh, <laughs> within the council? Uh, first, by listening. You know, we'll have over a dozen hours of public commentary and then council go in and vote. <laughs> for corporate interest, right? Um, so we could start with being responsive and giving a damn about what people think and how they feel and turning people's feelings into policy. Um, the other side to it is that I think it's time for us to be more innovative with where we put things, right? So young people are on social media. Why are we not streaming council meetings to Instagram, to TikTok, to Twitter. Because they're so, so long. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I mean, I got four-hour lives on my Instagram, right? And it's I not would, versus. Right. I would be more than happy uh, to stream, given my platform, uh, to the city. But I think it's time for that level of innovation, that level of transparency and accessibility for our people. I mean, I do the same thing with my classroom. Like, even before the pandemic... I stream my classes live on Instagram because I know that there are travel barriers, uh, transportation barriers for some of my students, and they need to be able to access it. And I have students who 
currently may be ill from COVID and they're out for a week or two and they're like, well, I didn't miss anything because I just watch your IG live. Why can't our government be the same way? Like, what's so difficult about that? I think it's just a matter of utilizing technology to make it more accessible for folks. No one should have to come down to City Hall to see a meeting. No one should have to go to, you know, uh, the, the city's government page, pull up, you know, the Zoom on there and all. It, it should just be there. It is really that simple. And it costs us nothing to do. What are some other things you would like to see change and how it could be on the mayor's side too, but just generally how the city interacts with the public? I would like for our elected officials to be available to everyday people. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the front lines of something. I mean, I even just think of one of the more recent movement actions we've had with the Atlanta homeless union and um, building an encampment on the grounds of city hall and seeing that our unsheltered community, unsheltered neighbors in the city just want someone to listen to them. But the response from folks on council who I reached out to was, well, they can just come to public comment for a city hall that ain't been open in over a year and a half, number one. Uh, but number two, they folks aren't willing to even just come outside. They shut it down, did they not? Absolutely. We were surrounded by 40 to 60 police officers. About nine folks got arrested. And I didn't get home till three o'clock in the morning uh, when they after they got arrested, making sure everyone got bailed out and got home. Um, but that's Atlanta's answer to homelessness, typically. Right. Atlanta has a, a culture of hiding homelessness or arresting people or giving them one way bus tickets or turning their shelters into jails and then hiring our siblings to run it. This is the culture of Atlanta. You know, we'll put boulders under bridges and dividers under tunnels and all of those type of things. Um, but we gotta do better as a city. And I think that starts with getting rid of those people who, I think of just, I don't know. You think they're out of touch? I think it's worse than out of touch. I think it's worse than out of touch. I think it is um, self-interest has taken over. I think there are people, especially in our city government, that feel like they own the seats they occupy. You know, if you were to tell someone, if I were to, you know, I remember talking to the incumbent in this seat and the response was, why are you running for my seat? That one would think that the people's seat, the people's houses are theirs, just shows how much is wrong, how nepotism has been allowed to just be the norm in this city, how we've created dynasties out of some of these families and people assume power in this city, but undeservedly, like literally haven't done much outside of being elected. And they have a sense of ownership that everyone should kiss the ring. Okay. I think I know how you feel about your opponent. Listen, <laughs> it, it, but you know what though? The sad thing is it's not just him. It's not just him. You know, one of the things that I, I find very interesting is, and you, you've you moderated debates and, and things like that, and you'll hear, you know, for those who were born in Atlanta, it's the first thing that comes out of their mouth. I was born and raised in Atlanta. Which has nothing to do with running for office. Nothing to do with running for office. And truth be told, Atlanta is such a beautiful city that offers so much opportunity. Like, my story could not be real anywhere else but Atlanta. And there are people who have come to Atlanta from outside of Atlanta who do more for Atlanta than those that are from Atlanta. The beautiful thing about Atlanta is there's something here for everybody. There's something here for everybody. So do when you... by default you believe because you are from here, like that's just enough, I'm sorry, but when it comes to making policy and representing the people, it's not just, if that's not enough. You mentioned your mother was born in South America. Mm -hmm. 
you know, one thing I've noticed about Atlanta, and I don't know if you feel the same way, is we focus a lot on black and white, mm-hmm. uh, even though we call ourselves an international city. Yeah. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah. Um, you know, it's very true. And I think really that is a symptom of the fact that like black culture in Atlanta is so strong. Um, but I mean, look, if you spend time in Atlanta, you know what the peacock feel like, right? You know what, you know, other Metro Atlanta areas feel like, you know, that there are particular areas where you can see, you know, certain international, uh, meccas within the city all over the place. Um, and I do think we have to be much more aware, especially in these times, um, about amplifying the presence of everyone in this city, our Latinx community, especially, you know, I was knocking doors today before coming here and I see a pamphlet with my picture on it. And I'm like, what is this? And there's folks from Latinx community that are promoting my campaign, knocking doors, folks who I've not met personally. And I think that shows why it is so important that everyone's existence in this city be appreciated, lauded, and amplified. One thing we haven't talked about is transportation. You mm-hmm. kind of briefly mentioned it when you mentioned uh, students not being able to get to the classroom. As a council member, what would you prioritize as it relates to transportation? And should there be transit on the belt line? So, yes, there should be transit on the belt line. I'm not sure what that looks like in all places. Like, I know the goal is to have rail, you know, around the entire belt line. And I know as a person who, you know, the annexing of the belt line ends in my backyard, um, off of Custer Avenue. Um, I'm frequently on the belt line on the east side, and I'm like, where do you put it? That's what I when I look at it, I'm like, where does this go? When you pass by Hawkers and you pass by all this, like, where does where it? you're walking? Yeah, <laughs> where right? So I just I have some concerns about that. Um, the other side to it is. You know, I don't know that Atlanta has invested in public transportation the way that it needs to. Um, You know, as a kid who went to high school in New Jersey, I rode the bus everywhere. And I'm talking about the the way the bus system is in Atlanta is if you have uh, your socioeconomical status says a lot about whether or not you ride MARTA. It typically, a lot of folks ride more because Marta. they have to. Right. But that's not always the norm either. And there's this distinction in the city or in, in the metro region where, oh, I'll take the train any day of the week, but yeah. I'm not going to take the bus. You will drive to the train. That's what my wife does. Like she, My wife works at Northside Hospital. She would drive to the train station to hop on the train to go you know, to the north side of town um, versus catching the bus. Right. Which might be just around station. the corner. Correct. And it says a lot about what is the product given out? Is it comfortable? Does it feel more convenient than driving? How frequent does it come? Can you rely on it? Do you feel safe on it? I think there's a myriad of things that need to be taken care of to make it what it should be and what it could be. Well, MARTA is in the middle of something called a bus network redesign, which will completely transform the bus experience as we know it today. And I think there's always this tension in transit planning of, do you want to go more places or do you want more frequency? I think it needs to be both, but also I think we have to acknowledge that Marta costs more money. I I agree, but do we want to pay for it through investing in people's ability to move through and around the city, or do we want to pay for it when we're dealing with the repercussions of pollution in our air, haze? Sure. And those type of things in the long run. Um, the other the other thing about that, if you go park your car in Jersey, I can bet it's going to be a lot more than if you go park your car in some neighborhood in the city of, in Atlanta. When you say a lot more, what do you mean? In terms of cost to park? Right, the cost of parking. Um, well, the thing is, is that you would walk out of your home and go catch the bus, right? So it's not uh, paying to park in different areas and that kind of thing. I mean... You know, paying to park downtown is is getting kind of crazy, especially if you have like events and things like that going on. Um, 
parking has become a huge issue. In fact, I think parking has become the, the main incentive for a lot of people to catch transit good. to go downtown and that type of thing. Right. And I am for, in, in my dream world, in my dream world, you would have a train going around all the 285, up 75, 85, up 400, across 20. You would be able to catch a train from Atlanta to Macon to Tifton to Valdosta. You'd be able to go to Savannah or Columbus. Like You would be able to do that on a train. And unfortunately, that's not something that we can do. And I think this is a regional issue. It's not just an Atlanta issue that's in right. terms of train. The other side is that MARTA has been used to like redline in the city for a long time. It's been a method to keep uh, certain folks from being able to access certain parts of town, which is why it's not been allowed in certain places. And I think that it's time for us to have a real reckoning about that, about that conversation and what that means and what the implications are um, and what type of negative consequences we've reaped for it. And then how do we rectify that? Um, you know, it's time for us as a city uh, to start really having some come to Jesus conversations with some of our surrounding metropolitan areas. Yeah, I remember in 20, I think it was 19, I was working in Gwinnett on the referendum there. Mm -hmm. And this woman, older white woman, says to me, um, it's not that I'm against MARTA. It's just that I don't want those people coming to my neighborhood. How come folk don't keep it real about that notion? You know, folk talk about like, you know, oh, Marta should do this and we should do that. And I'm like, why don't y'all tell the truth? Yeah. But you know who, where there's also a, a stigma is more affluent black people. Yes. Listen, of all the isms that we deal with in Atlanta, whether it be sexism or racism, we've got two isms that we don't address. Classism. Classism ageism and elitism okay atlanta is a city where a lamborghini will pass a tent city every day several times a day and no one thinks twice about it we've kind of normalized this gap between our communities within our communities and you have you know me as an educator i i speak out on academic elitism a lot but this is kind of the, this is the consequence of that academic elitism. Those who have achieved something or, or have done something, they feel so much better than or separated from, from others. But, you know, as the great philosopher Sean Carter said, you know, still. <laughs> still. Um, talk to me about ageism. Yeah. Um, you know, again, this is something that even within education, you see, like when those young educators come in fresh out of college, you're, you're told to, you know, shut up, serve for three years, and then you can talk, and then you kind of know something. Um, and it's funny how, like, this pandemic has given so much more credibility to younger people because... Uh, more tech savvy, right. Right? Uh, but we see the same kind of thing happening, like, when it comes to government. You know, there are some folks who will look at me and say, you know, you you look young and, you know, I'm a 37 year old man, so I'm not quite that young to my students. I'm unk status. Um, but uh, you you see this this kind of feeling or this this. Um, this sense of lack of credibility afforded to young people that uh, they got to prove themselves. They have to run the receipts on their credentials. They have to do all these things to be worthy, to have a voice, to have a say, to be at the table, to run for an office, um, those type of things. When the truth is, is that now we're at a time where if you are not innovative, you are dying slowly. Um, and the consequences are huge for our city right now. I mean, there are municipalities where access to the internet is a norm. There are municipalities where no one has to sleep outside because transitional housing is a part of the infrastructure. These things are normative in many places, but in a city like Atlanta that's supposed to be progressive, in a city like Atlanta that's supposed to mean all of these things, especially for Black folks, it's not true. Do you think we play too small in Atlanta? I think we play too safe. I think 
we have allowed some to stay in office for too long and it has stymied our ability to move forward. And I think when you allow a status quo to become normative, um, no matter how progressive they may have been in their day, things evolve and things change and they change faster than typically people do. And so if you allow folks to hold on to the threshold of power, they'll slow you down rather than taking you where you're supposed to be. I think that's a great way to end the show. <laughs> Thank you, Shivy. Thank you. My name is Alfred Shivy Brooks, and I'm running for Atlanta City Council Post 1 at large. If you believe that Atlanta should be a more connected city and every person should have access to the internet, if you believe that Atlanta should be more affordable and should not be the worst place in America to live in if you have a low income, if you believe that Atlanta City government should be more responsive to the needs of its people, that we should have more economic stability, and that we are a city that could be safer without criminalizing race, or socioeconomic status, then I need you to support our campaign for change. My name is Alfred Shivy Brooks, and I promise you that together we can make Atlanta a place that we are proud to give to our kids. Thank you.